Hi, I'm Danchi, and in today's video, I'm going to talk about the difference between self-hosting something at home and self-hosting it on a VPS. So if you don't know a VPS, it's just a, a virtual private server. It's like having your own server, but it's somewhere else in some remote location and you're connecting to it with an SSH key or SSH password that you specified and gave to a VPS provider, such as Vulture, Lino, these sort of people. One thing I'll say is the biggest advantage to using your own hardware is of course freedom and control. If I wanna unplug my server, I go there and I unplug my server. I don't trust some VPS company to turn it off. And of course, most of these VPSs are also virtual machines, which means that they're not using real hardware. And if you want real hardware, you gotta pay a lot of money to rent that real hardware. So what I like to do, of course, is have my own little machine that does everything for me. And I don't have to rely on a virtual machine, which will always be slower than real actual physical hardware. This especially applies if you're doing something like cloud storage. So let's say you have a next cloud or, or a sync thing or something like that, and you have it on your local network connected to your router or switch or whatever and then it's connected to your computer. Now obviously transferring files and doing SSH and everything is gonna be infinitely faster like that than it would be on the internet. And this especially applies if you live in an area where you're quite far away from any VPS providers. Like for example, I spend a lot of time in the Middle East. That's where I study and do things. And in the Middle East, you pretty much can't get a VPS that's close to you. The closest things are in Europe, which means that latency between SSH and all that kind of thing, it's just, it's very difficult to use. And also it just doesn't make much sense because people connecting to you might be connecting also from the Middle East. If you just wanna have a server with friends, then it makes sense to host it in your house so everybody connects to you directly and it's just so much faster than for all of them to connect to Amsterdam or New York or something. So speed and cost and freedom are probably the three biggest advantages. I said cost because buying your own hardware for self-hosting is really, really cheap. Like I just use old laptops and an old computer. Now obviously a lot of modern programs like Matrix, Synapse Server, and especially anything cryptocurrency related, like downloading a whole node, you're gonna need an SSD and some type of relatively modern processor, like maybe a fourth generation Core i3 or Core i5 or something, but for literally everything else, like a personal website or a basic little chat server or something like a mumble even like a voice chat mumble you can basically use anything it doesn't really matter anything from the last 10 years is perfectly usable if not over the top for something like a personal website you can probably host a personal website of like a of like a phone or or a Wii or something or something completely ridiculous like that because it's so simple that's the thing about self-hosting at home you pay relatively little for hardware that you own yourself and can control and then of course that's just you don't have to keep paying a subscription fee or something to a VPS provider you have to keep paying of course there are some disadvantages though so the first main one is dynamic DNS dynamic DNS is when you unplug your router or something happens at your ISP company the internet cuts out but when it comes back your IP address your public one is completely changed now there's also the trouble of setting up a local static IP address so that means that you have your own computer connected to your router or something then if you disconnect it reconnect it then it might get a different local IP address but that's literally never happened to me and it's always been fine so I don't know uh, maybe it's just the default Debian setup sets that up for you automatically which is excellent but anyways it's really easy to set up and the most difficult thing to deal with is of course a dynamic DNS which is when your public IP changes but that also is really easy to get around so this thing called dynamic DNS services and these dynamic DNS services essentially get you to run a program on your computer that pings some server which then pings your provider your DNS provider you know, epic or something like Cloudflare, whatever you use and then it connects to them and changes the records accordingly to the correct IP address and I don't have that set up but I do have something else set up it's this thing called duck DNS it's it's very very stupid really but it is quite useful and what they do at duck DNS is they give you you can get a domain name with their domain so for example I have denshi.duckdns and denshi2.duckdns for my like two servers in different locations and uh, what you can do is you can get a little script that they give you. So when you set up these domains, you've set up an account and all you really need is, is a token from this account. And you essentially ping them with a little script from whatever computer you're using and they change the IP address of that domain for you. Which means that you can essentially have two domains that will always be set to the correct IP because whatever public IP your server gets, even if you unplug your router and it changes the IP for your whole home, 
that server is going to ping DuckDNS and DuckDNS is going to accordingly change their domain name. And then even if you're in a remote area, you don't have access to the computer directly, you can still look at the DuckDNS IP and say, yeah, that's the new IP. And then you can go and set that for all the other DNS records. So that's a very overcomplicated way of doing things. I'm sure you can automate all of this, but that's like a simple little brutal solution, just a brute force solution. But anyways, that's probably the biggest inconvenience with Sophos. The second biggest inconvenience is NATs. NATs which essentially just means your router not really knowing what ports different computers are listening on. And the solution is that most routers have an option called DMZ or Demilitarized Zone, which lets you set one local IP address to a public IP address. And that little server, whatever it's connected to that, that has complete access to everything else. Now, not all routers have this. Here in Italy, the company we get our internet from has this, which is really cool. However, some routers don't come with it. You'll just have to port forward stuff. And some routers don't even let you port forward anything. In that case, you've got a very authoritarian ISP and you're pretty much forced to set up a VPS, which is upsetting. But that's the biggest, second biggest inconvenience is NAT. So you gotta port forward things, like even basic things. I have this detailed on my wiki because I know people will forget to do it. Like I always forget to port forward ports, but something like port forwarding the 80 port and 443 port and 8448 port for matrix and different ports for different things like one for a VPN, one for this, one for that, all that kind of stuff. So that's annoying. And I think the other thing that's really annoying is things like RDNS entries and other ISP specific things. So let's say you want to set up an email server on a physical server. First of all, it might actually be impossible to do. Why? Well, because a lot of ISPs, they stop you from doing things like setting up RDNS or reverse DNS. Reverse DNS essentially lets you, well, it's exactly what it sounds like. You take an IP address, like let's say this is the IP address of my email server, and then it resolves to a domain name. Now, VPS providers let you do this. There's a really good one called BitLaunch. It's paid entirely in cryptocurrency. It's anonymous, all, all these sort of, well, an as anonymous something as your email can be. And it's useful because you can essentially set your server name to that name. So if I set my server host name to denshi.live, which is my domain name, then they automatically set up reverse DNS for you. And then all, all you gotta do is contact support, ask them to open up email ports, and then boom, you can get your email server up and running in five minutes. So if you wanted to do it on a physical server, you'd have to contact your ISP instead and ask them, hey, can you give me a static IP address and also a reverse DNS thing, they're not going to do it. Or if they do, they're going to make you pay an exorbitant price for it, which is obviously ridiculous. And it sort of ruins the whole point, in my opinion, of saving money with self-hosted at home. So yeah, that's generally my opinions of self-hosting at home versus self-hosting on VPS. There is one last thing I wanted to mention that VPS providers put stupid restrictions on you. Like they'll say, oh, can't use this. You can't modify the kernel of this, or you can't like set up a VPN on your VPS or, or something stupid because they have a separate package for that dude. You have this package for a VPN, this one's for this. It's, it's just completely ridiculous in my opinion. You should be able to set up a VPN on anything you want or you should be able to modify the kernel of your VPS and do that kind of thing. But I understand why they don't do it because that's their business problem. And of course, with your own physical hardware, you're free to do whatever you want and you own it. So yeah, in conclusion, those are the reasons I sort of like physical hosting better than VPS hosting. Those are the general differences. The one thing I really need a VPS for though is my email server. So I got I got a new email there, alex at denchi.live. If you wanna email me there, uh, I probably won't be using it a whole lot because I don't know how much I'm gonna be paying the VPS provider still for. But anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video on VPS versus self-hosting at home. I've been Denshi. Goodbye.